Hello there guys, and welcome back to another video. And today, I will be completing my two-part discussion of the changes that have been made to the Bible, and what they mean exactly. Link to the previous part in the description below. Last time I showed that several verses in the Bible have been both unintentionally and intentionally altered by copying scribes over the centuries, these changes ending up in our modern Bibles. We know this because we have thousands of older copies of the biblical texts stretching back into the ancient times of Jesus, and even older, that reveal differences between our modern versions and these much older ones. Goliath probably was around 7 feet tall and not 10. Jesus might not have forgiven those who attended his crucifixion in the original Gospel of Luke. And the Apostle Junia, mentioned in one of Paul's letters, was probably a woman and not a dude as later scribes would change her to be. All these changes are well known and supported by the evidence. And let us continue. Number 5. The Missing Adulteress The passage involving Jesus and the adulterous woman, found in the Gospel of John chapters 7 and 8, also known as the Pericopic Adulterae, is one of the New Testament's most famous stories. Recorded only in the Gospel of John, during one of Jesus' travels, he is confronted in a town by a group of Jewish priests who dragged a woman accused of committing adultery before him. These priests demanded to know if Jesus agreed with the punishment for such a crime, as commanded by Moses, stoning the young woman to death. It was a clever trap. If he agreed, he would make a fool of his own teachings of love and mercy. If he disagreed, he would be violating the Jewish law and contradicting one of God's own prophets. We are told that Jesus calmly and collectively responds to the priest by writing something unknown in the dirt and proclaiming the now famous phrase, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. The priests and the crowd, upon hearing this, quietly leave, seemingly recognizing they are equally as sinful. Jesus and the accused woman are left alone. The Nazarene tells her, I do not condemn you, go and sin no more. To many, this is one of Jesus' most memorable teachings, and it's a dang good passage and message about mercy and forgiveness. It is even depicted in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ as a flashback, though the film adds the detail of the unnamed woman being Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' closest followers, a detail that is not contained in the verses. As beloved as this passage may be, it is almost definitely an addition to the Gospel of John, and not original part of the text. First of all, the story is completely absent in all of our oldest copies of the Gospel of John. It is not found in Papyrus 66 or Papyrus 75, written around 200 AD, nor is it found in either the Codex Sinaiticus or Codex Vaticanus, written in around the 300s AD. All of these copies of John skip over the account, seemingly flowing directly from the verses prior into the ones that occur after in our modern Bibles. The earliest manuscript that actually contains the story is in the Codex Bizet, which was written in 400s to 500s AD. Other details about the story seem to lend credence to it being an edit. As several biblical scholars have noted, it is stylistically distinct from the writing that can be found both before and after it in the text. It uses a large number of words and phrases that are otherwise alien to the rest of the gospel, again suggesting it was written by a different hand. All the evidence points to this passage being an addition to the original Gospel of John, and very few biblical scholars these days will argue in favor of the passage being authentic. In truth, it appears like it was inserted into the Gospel by a scribe or group of scribes centuries after it was written. Number 4. Compassion or Anger Jesus is generally looked at as the picture of level-headedness and friendliness. However, in some versions of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 41, a very different and kind of bizarre picture is painted. In the excerpt, a leper, not a leopard, approaches Jesus frantically begging him to heal his horrible illness, knowing that Jesus was said to work miracles on the sick or injured. Now depending on the manuscript you are reading, Jesus responds to this man with either by feeling compassion or by becoming super angry at this man. Jesus then proceeds to heal him and then, rebuking him severely, immediately he cast him out and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. The now healed man apparently does not listen to Jesus and tells his miraculous experience to the inhabitants of a city, causing a stir to the point Jesus was no longer able to enter into the city publicly. Bruh. Now, this rather odd story is made difficult to comprehend by the strongly conflicting versions of Jesus' emotions toward the sick man in it. In some manuscripts, Jesus gets angry or irritated at him, while in others, Jesus feels pity or compassion for him. 
two polar opposite emotions, and two completely different Greek words. Clearly not the work of a simple scribal mistake, but an intentional change. But which one was the original? Most modern English translators favor the Jesus feeling compassion version, as it is written in the majority of the manuscripts and fits the common image of Jesus as a kind and well-tempered man. However, this choice might be wrong, and it is possible that the feeling anger reading with the angry Jesus is the original and the compassionate one is the alteration. Why might this be the case? In contrast with the other Gospels, Jesus, as portrayed in Mark, is not the nicest person. He's charismatic, but not exactly soft-spoken. He's not the sanitized nice guy of Luke or Matthew, but a stern and strong man that emerges from the wilderness on a mission. He gets angry and loses his temper several times in Mark in a manner he rarely does so in the other Gospels. For example, Jesus looks at those in a synagogue with anger when they watch him heal a man with a withered hand. Jesus getting irritated with the man asking to be healed also appears to fit the resolution of the story better than the feeling compassion version. If you notice, after healing the man, Jesus kicks him out and sternly orders him to, well, shut up, which the man doesn't follow. Jesus seemingly wanted to keep a low profile when entering the city, and healing this man screwed that up. It is entirely possible that later scribes copying this verse in the Gospel of Mark thought it would be best to make Jesus nicer rather than being kind of mean and stern, changing the word anger to compassion. Some scholars have noted that this would be more likely, as there would be little motive for Christian scribes to do the reversal, changing compassion to anger, though this is contested by other scholars. The point is, similar to Jesus' prayer on the cross in Luke in the last episode, the verse has been changed, but we aren't exactly sure which version is the original. Number 3. The Ominous Original Ending Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead, three days after his execution through crucifixion, is an especially important aspect of modern Christianity. Most people are familiar with this story often retold around the holidays of Good Friday and Easter Sunday, or through films like The Passion of the Christ. The Gospels each provide slightly discrepant accounts of how after Jesus' death, his body was placed in a tomb which was sealed by a large stone. A group of three, or two, or a single woman, depending on which gospel you are reading, visits the tomb and finds that the massive stone has been rolled away and Jesus' body missing. The Gospels kind of differ with what happened next. The Gospel of Mark's version is especially interesting when you reach this part of the story. Mark 16 states, The three women, one of whom is Mary Magdalene, find a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting, and they get freaked out. He says, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. It is generally interpreted that this man in white is an angel or messenger of God who tells the women that Jesus is alive in the region of Galilee and they should tell Jesus' disciples of what they have found and pursue him. Mark 16 verse 8 concludes with, So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Apparently, they, the women, do not listen to God's instructions and do not tell their fellow disciples or anyone of what they saw or were told. Instead, keeping it a secret. Now, here's where things get very, very interesting. In most modern English Bibles, Mark chapter 16 continues after verse 8. Verses 9 through 18 tell of how Jesus himself, back from the dead, appears to first Mary Magdalene. She later tells several disciples who do not believe her. Jesus then appears in front of two unnamed disciples who are once again not believed. Then, for a third time, Jesus appears to all of the eleven remaining apostles at a dinner. Verses 19 and 20 conclude with Jesus finally leaving, ascending into heaven, and sitting at God's right hand, concluding with the disciples going out and preaching his message in return to the world. Now, the ending of Mark's gospel has been the source of much textual criticism and debate. Many biblical scholars have found discrepancies that call into question the authenticity of verses 9 through 20. Our oldest and most complete copies of Mark, the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, both end at Mark 16 verse 8, with the three women departing from Jesus' empty tomb and the man in white, 
and telling no one of what they saw there. No Jesus appearing to Mary Mag, nor to the two disciples, nor to the eleven apostles at dinner. These manuscripts are not damaged or missing pages or anything. The story just ends there, with the scribe denoting the conclusion of the document by writing kata markon, or according to Mark, after verse 8, and then continuing to copy the Gospel of Luke. Nothing has been erased or removed from the documents here. It is only in later text made around or after 400 AD that we get the long ending of Mark, verses 9 through 20, seen in our modern Bibles. Once again, we are confronted with a predicament. The oldest manuscripts omit verses 9 through 20, while later ones include verses 9 through 20. There is also a rival third ending of Mark that can be found in a select few manuscripts called the short ending, which picks up after verse 8 and states that the women reported their story to Peter and Jesus appears to them. Some later manuscripts only have the long ending, some only have the short, others have a Frankenstein combination of long and short, and finally some have neither, preferring to end at verse 8. Woof, so many competing versions makes you want to pull your hair out, doesn't it? You probably are asking yourself which one was the original ending of the Gospel of Mark. Most scholars agree that verses 9 through 20, that is, the long ending, was almost definitely not a part of the original text of Mark, but a later addition, a J.K. Rowling insertion, if you will. Many aspects, such as the language and style of the verses, as well as all our oldest texts omitting them, support this theory. Most have concluded something similar about the short ending, which only appears in a select few later manuscripts. Now, scholars debate what the original ending of Mark might have been if it wasn't the long or short endings. Some suggest that a fourth, as of yet unknown ending after verse 8 has been lost to history. However, others suggest that the Gospel of Mark very well might have originally ended at verse 8, with the other endings being tacked on by scribes centuries later. This changes everything, if true. When one reads the versions of Mark that end at verse 8, it actually makes one's retroactive view of the Gospel very sad. In this version, nobody knows that Jesus has risen from the dead, because the women don't say anything, because they were afraid. And then it just ends. It's ambiguous ominous and abrupt and sticks with the reader, it's a massive cliffhanger and raises so many questions. The reader is left to ask, if the women didn't say anything to anyone, and thus nobody was able to pursue Jesus in Galilee, how did the disciples ever learn of the resurrection? Did they even learn? Was what the mysterious man in white said even true? We don't know. The author doesn't tell us. In this version, we don't actually see Jesus alive after his crucifixion, just the empty tomb. We are simply told of it and left to wonder what happened next. Some might shout, how could that be the ending? But researchers have pointed out that this abrupt ending is actually very in line with the themes and motifs of Mark. In Mark, unlike with the other Gospels, many people, even Jesus' followers, repeatedly do not listen to his or God's instructions. The disciples on several occasions just don't seem to get it and do not understand Jesus' sayings, sometimes to his aggravation. The abrupt ending very well might be a callback to the beginning of Mark where Jesus heals the leper and he orders him not to tell anyone about it, but the man does not listen and tells the whole city. Perhaps ironically, the author is pointing out that when God orders people to do the opposite, proclaim, and spread his word, they choose once again to disobey and stay silent, leaving the reader with an impactful, punch-in-the-gut moral lesson about obedience. Later scribes, perhaps missing this message, could not handle this abrupt and somewhat uncomfortable ending to the Gospel, and thus added the twelve verses we see in our modern Bibles. Whatever the reasons for the additions were, we can be pretty certain that the ending or ending seen in our modern English Bibles is not the original, and was an intentional change. Number 2. Rapid Fire Round Before we reach the number one change, I'd like to do a rapid-fire round listing off some minor changes with shorter explanations. If you want to learn more, you can look these up for yourself. Alrighty. There are some intentional changes that appear to have been localizations of the text. Just like how Japanese manga translations sometimes must be altered to best fit a region, so was the Bible. One of these can be seen in Matthew 16, in a passage where Jesus talks about the weather. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky. Some manuscripts have left out this verse, while others have it. 
Scholars theorize that it was removed by copyists in regions like Egypt because in these climates a red sky in the morning does not announce rain. Audiences in climates like these might read Jesus' statement and think he didn't know what he was talking about. Some changes probably were done as a way to resolve perceived contradictions through the use of retcons. I'll use an unrelated example to illustrate this principle. I'm a big fan of the Song of Ice and Fire book series written by George R. R. Martin, and as amazing as the books are, Martin still makes mistakes. In Book 3, A Storm of Swords, the character of Jane Westerling is described as having good, that is, wide, hips. While in Book 4, A Feast for Crows, originally published in 2005, she is described as having narrow hips. Some scrupulous fans, nerds like me, saw the hip-shaped contradiction and theorized that the hips don't lie and that the Jane Westerling in Feast is not the same one as the one seen in Storm of Swords, perhaps being a fake or look-alike. Yes, that's how crazy we are. The book's author, George R. R. Martin, has repeatedly stated that this is in truth a simple mistake on his part. He got it wrong. As a result, all curtain editions of A Feast for Crows made after 2011 have removed the reference to Jane's hips in the passage with a very, very minor change to the sentence. But the original mistake still remains in the older and some digital copies of A Feast for Crows circulating around before the mistake had been pointed out. Very similar things have been done to passages in the Bible, just over a much greater span of time. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 34, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he is given wine mixed with gall to drink. However, in a sizable amount of manuscripts, he is not given wine, but vinegar mixed with gall to drink. Similar sour tasting fluids, but not the same type of drink, and again, not the result of some simple spelling error. The change might have been made by some scribes from wine to vinegar to best fit an Old Testament prophecy in Psalms. They poisoned my food with gall and gave me vinegar to quench my thirst. In another example, although most of us are more familiar with the conflict between David and Goliath, 2 Samuel also discusses a second but very similar battle, rendered into modern English Bibles as, in another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan son of Jar, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. In some Bibles, you might see a little subscript citation that reads, Hebrew does not have the brother of. As it turns out, the actual translation of 2 Samuel based on the Hebrew should read like this, Elhanan son of Jar the Bethlehemite killed Goliath the Gittite. The words, the brother of, was straight up added into the English text much later. This change originates in the King James Bible of 1611, where a scribe inserted the three words to fix or retcon the perceived contradiction of the giant warrior Goliath being killed twice in Samuel by two different people, once by David and then again by Elhanan. One last change that I thought was really interesting is in Mark chapter 6 verse 3. In the passage, people from Jesus' own town, upon listening to his teachings, are astonished and ask, Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James? This actually is the only passage in the entire New Testament in which Jesus is referred to as a carpenter. The Greek word used is tekton. The real meaning of this word is more nondescript than carpenter. It essentially refers to anyone who makes things with his hands, which can include the profession of being a carpenter, but a more accurate translation could be something like construction worker or day laborer. A tecton would more likely be building fences and yokes and even houses, not fancy modern tables or cabinets. Nonetheless, there are some versions of Mark chapter 6 verse 3 that do not say Jesus was a carpenter, but instead say he was the son of a carpenter. The earliest manuscript of Mark P45 reads like this, Is this not the son of a carpenter? It's not exactly clear why a change was made here, or even which one was the original. It should be noted that a tecton was a very low-class profession, and some, namely Romans and other pagans, looked at it with disgust. We do know that some early Christians in the first few centuries, like Origen, disliked the claim that Jesus was a carpenter, and stated that in none of the Gospels current in the churches is Jesus himself even described as being a carpenter. Scribes might have changed Jesus from being a carpenter to the mere son of a carpenter to make Jesus' origins and profession prior to his teachings slightly more noble and respectable in the eyes of pagans. Number 1. Books Removed Alrighty, the final change of the Bible I will feature in this two-part series is a big one, and it's the fact that there's been entire books removed from the Bible. What? 
Yeah, the 66 or 73 or 80 books, depending on what sect of Christianity you belong to, of the Old and New Testaments that constitute our modern English Bibles have not always been consistent throughout history. Whenever archaeologists uncover older manuscripts and copies of the biblical books like Genesis or Exodus or the Gospels, which allow us to identify these textual changes that have occurred over time, they are often found in caches amongst copies of dozens, if not hundreds, of other books that are not found in our modern Bibles. When the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of our oldest copies of the books of the Old Testament, were discovered by chance in a remote desert cave in what was then Jordan, it was somewhat uncomfortable to find that intermixed with these documents were books that no average Christian or Jew in the modern day had ever even seen before. The Book of Noah, the Book of Giants, the Book of Enoch, the Letter of Jeremiah, the Book of Tobit, the Wisdom of Sirach. All of these are books that are omitted by the canon of most sects of Judaism and Christianity today, but they appear to have been deemed just as important to the ancient Jews as canonical texts like Genesis, Samuel, and Isaiah. Furthermore, several caches of New Testament texts have been found containing both canonical and non-canonical texts. The Nag Hammadi Library was discovered by an Egyptian peasant in the 1940s and 50s. An early Christian monk almost 2,000 years ago had buried dozens of books and manuscripts in a tomb in an ancient graveyard, perhaps fearing they would be destroyed. And there they were left, forgotten and buried for centuries. These Christian texts are very, very fascinating, as they date to about the same time as our earliest copies of the Gospels and other New Testament texts, but provide us a very different view of Christianity. The early Christians who wrote and believed these books were part of an early sect called the Gnostics. The Gnostics differed from other Christians in many respects, one of them being that they believed the God of the New Testament and Old Testament were two different beings, the Old Testament God being evil and cruel. They were often denounced as heretics by the leaders of rival Christian sects, who eventually won by proclaiming the Gnostic books were heresy, and burned and destroyed most of them as a result. We can only picture the bitterness of the unknown Gnostic monk who must have hid the Nag Hammadi text hoping they would be spared the great cleansing that befell most of these heretical books. He might have crossed his fingers, wishing that his treasured beliefs would survive into the uncertain future. Which well, he succeeded, and they did survive. Among these texts were the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Truth, the Wisdom of Jesus Christ, the Gnosis of the Invisible God, and perhaps most famous, the Gospel of Judas. All of them give us a look into what some early Christians believed, and took as gospel, pun entirely intended, before a clear canon was developed. The Gospel of Judas is a fascinating read if you ever get the chance. The book essentially retells the typical story found in our modern canonical Gospels, but attempts to recontextualize the relationship between Judas and Jesus in a different light. It alleges that Judas did not betray Jesus, but was in fact his most adherent and intelligent follower. In the famous Last Supper scene, Jesus is disappointed at the ignorance of his own disciples. They do not understand who he is or what his mission is. Judas alone out of them tells Jesus that, I know who you are and where you come from. You are from the mortal realm of Barbelo. This intrigues Jesus, and he privately speaks with his rogue disciple. He convinces Judas that in order to complete his heavenly mission, he must shed his bodily form and ascend to the stars. According to the Gospel, Judas was in truth not betraying Jesus, but was following his direct but secret orders when he gave him up for crucifixion. Some might consider the Gospel of Judas closer to ancient deviant art fan fiction, but such alternative narratives and books are common and illustrate to us that there were, and still are, hundreds of books that did not end up in our modern English Bibles, but were once read and believed by early Christians and Jews around the same time as the texts that did end up in our modern English Bibles. Some of these believers dying over the authenticity of their own texts at the swords of other believers who considered them to be heretics. The decision of which books ended up as canon and which were heretical was very much something that was based off of who in the early church had the largest political power and influence at that time. The reason why the book of Acts is in your Bible and the Gospel of Judas is not was something decided either on the battlefield or by popular vote through religious councils like the Council of Rome, Antioch, Nicaea, Hippo, Carthage, and Florence. Perhaps if the outcomes of battles or votes came out differently, we'd have 67 or 103 or 230 books in our Bibles. It's why Catholics have 73 books in their Bibles, while other denominations have 66. 
Sex and fractures within Christianity and Judaism are nothing new, and they have existed and have continued to exist since the religions began thousands of years ago. In conclusion, the Bible has been changed throughout history. Anyone who has taken the time to research the evidence with an open mind, regardless of if they are Christian or Jewish or agnostic, has acknowledged this. The Bible is not some unaltered, changeless text that has remained exactly how it is over thousands of years, but has been changed, altered, added to, and subtracted for millennia ever since the texts were first written by the quills of their dozens of unknown authors. These changes have been made by hundreds of nameless scribes for reasons that were politically and theologically motivated. We should have enough respect for the Bible to admit this. I do not think it is anything to be a source of anger or shame from. I believe the research and textual criticism conducted on the Bible that I have discussed in these videos only make the Bible more interesting to me. It's deep and rich with history, and that's why I love it. And with that, thank you so much for watching this installment of Trey the Explainer. I hope you learned something new. Stay tuned for future videos. I plan to take a little break from the Bible and get back to cryptids and history and dinosaurs and all that. So fingers crossed if you like that stuff. But I will return to the Bible sometime later. All right. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye. Ain't nothing gonna break my stride. Ain't nobody gonna slow me down. Oh no, I got to keep on moving.